need to be thinking of these things. I'm not even going to cover those today, but it just I want you to I want you to remember Acts 22. Acts 22, verse 1 through 3. Brethren and fathers, hear my defense before you now. And when they heard that he spoke to them uh, in the Hebrew language, they kept all the more silent. Then he said, I am indeed a Jew born in Tarsus of Cilicia, but brought up in the city at the feet of Gamaliel, taught according to the strictness of our father's law, and was zealous towards God as you are all today. You all are today. Gamaliel, so what does he just reveal? He just revealed that he's from Hillel. He just revealed that he's of the Hillel mindset because Gamaliel was his teacher. Then he goes on to ex explain his encounter with Messiah there on the road to Damascus. Then when he says this, though, verse 19, so I, so I said, Lord, they know that in every synagogue I imprisoned you and beat those imprisoned and beat those who believed on you. And when the blood of your martyr Stephen was shed, I also was standing by consenting to his death. And guarding the clothes of those who were killing him, then he said to me, Depart, for I will send you far from here to the Gentiles. Listen to the wording. Depart, for I will send you far from here to the Gentiles. What's the very next verse? And they listened to him until this word. And then they raised their voices and said, Away with such a fellow from the earth, for he is not fit to live. You're going to see Shammai popping their heads up constantly in the word of God. It's really... When you can learn to identify it, it really is amazing. Which makes Peter's vision all that much more crucial. The vision of the, of the animals coming down. And, and many will try to teach this, that, that this is the Lord now saying that all foods are clean. It doesn't work. It's not even what the word says there. Because what happens? It says that Peter saw the vision three times. Then it said he was really perplexed at the vision. Really perplexed. It would be like it would be like one of us sitting here and you understanding that the Lord's dietary instructions are still are still his commandment for today. And it'd be like one of us seeing a sheet come down from heaven and people standing in the sheet and there's a gun there and the Lord says, Pick up the gun and shoot. We'd all be going, Why would God tell me to do something that he's already told me not to do? We'd be perplexed at the vision. Peter is perplexed at the vision. Why would God tell me to do something that he's already told me not to do? Then he comes to the realization. Oh, verse 28. I am not to call any man unclean, common or unclean. Nothing to do with food. Okay? Nothing to do with food. So, again, we looked at that verse earlier when he said, when he, when he, when he quoted from Shammai, he was dealing with this whole separation that Shammai uh, had brought with the Gentiles. We quoted that it was, we saw from the Babylonian Talmud that it was from Shammai. What happens next? Cornelius tells his story. Tells his story of what, what happened. The man, uh, the man coming and, uh, and uh, you know, the, the appearance of the man, what he told him. I'm going to go back to it. Okay. Then look at what happens, what Peter says in verse 34. Then Peter opened his mouth and said, In truth, I perceive that God shows no partiality. But in every nation, whoever fears him and works righteousness is accepted by him. This is a, a key moment for Peter. Imagine you've been raised with this understanding. And then the Lord just completely opens your eyes to the understanding that he is calling the Gentiles in. And he says, now I see that God shows no favoritism. No favoritism. He said, of every nation, in every nation, whoever fears him and works righteousness is accepted by him. This is a major revelation for Peter. Now watch what happens. Let's go a little farther forward. Let's go to verse, or to, yeah, to verse 44. While Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit fell upon all those who heard the word. And those of the circumcision who believed were astonished, as many as came with Peter. Why are they astonished? Because they have always learned the same thing, that they have no place in the life to come. They were astonished, came to Peter, uh, as, as many as came with Peter, because the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on the Gentiles also. For they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. 
Then Peter answered, Can anyone forbid water that these should not be baptized who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. Then they asked him to stay a few days. What has just happened here? If you understand the house of Elel, if you understand the house of Shammai, what Peter has just done is absolutely confronted Shammai. Because the house of Shammai, this is what they taught. The process of salvation, circumcision priority number one. Circumcision priority number one if you're going to declare salvation. If you're going to be a part of the kingdom. Number two was the mikvah, the immersion in water. Okay, that was number two. What has Peter just done? They've just been, been, been received the Holy Spirit. What does he do? Let's mikvah. Let's mikvah. He has just completely come against Shammai. Let me show you that. Watch this. Babylonian Talmud, Tractate Yevamot, 46a. Our rabbis taught if a proselyte was circumcised but had not performed the prescribed ritual ablution, ablution being the immersion, the water immersion for cleansing, Rabbi Eleazar said, Behold, he is a proper proselyte, for so we find that our forefathers were circumcised and not performed ritual ablution. If he performed the prescribed ablution but had not been circumcised, Rabbi Joshua said, Behold, he is a proper proselyte, for we, for so we find that the mothers had performed ritual ablution, but had not been circumcised. The sages, however, said, Whether we had performed ritual ablution, but had not circumcised, or whether we had been circumcised, but not performed the prescribed ritual ablution, he is not a proper proselyte unless he has been circumcised and has also performed the prescribed ritual ablution. This is huge. This gives us understanding why Paul took such an aggressive stance against circumcision. This is huge because we see this was the mindset. Circumcision first. And so, what did Peter do? Peter just stood and absolutely opposed the house of Shammai by mickling the new believers rather than circumcising them at first. So, the process for the house of Shammai was circumcision precedes everything. Then you have the mikvah, the cleansing, then you have the, the rest of the process that they would go through. I believe there was a seven step, at least a seven step process. What I want you to see is I want you to get into the mindset of Shammai for a moment because it's really going to help us to understand Paul better. Because their order of salvation, again, beginning with, with circumcision. Watch this saying right here. This is from the Babylonian Talmud, Tractate Shabbat 135a. Bet Shammai maintained. One must cause a few drops of the covenant blood to flow from him. While Beit Hillel rule, it is unnecessary. Rabbi Simeon B. Eleazar said, Beit Shammai and Beit Hillel did not differ concerning him who is born circumcised, that they must cause a few drops of the covenant blood to flow from him. Because it is a suppressed foreskin. About what do they differ? About a proselyte who was converted when already circumcised. There, Bet Shammai maintained, one must cause a few drops of the covenant blood to flow from him, whereas Bet Hillel ruled, one need not cause a few drops of covenant blood to flow from him. What is happening here? This shows, get into the mindset of Hillel, or of Shammai. Shammai, circumcision was so vital, was so was so uh, uh, pre preceding everything that even if, listen to this, even if a baby had been circumcised, but if it was found that he wasn't walking in the covenant, Ben Shammai said he needs to be cut again even if he's already circumcised. He needs to bleed some fresh blood out of the foreskin. 
That, but doesn't that give you some insight into Shammai? Into why circumcision, circumcision, circumcision. Even if a baby already came and they were circumcised, Shammai said they need to be cut again. They need to bleed some fresh blood out of that womb. It gives you some insight into, are you seeing this? I'm looking at your faces, making sure you're seeing this. It gives you some insight into where Shammai was coming from. And why circumcision was such a big deal. And why Paul took the stance that he did with circumcision. Many today interpret that, that Paul was saying, that commandment just needs to be thrown out. But that's not the case. Paul wasn't against circumcision. Paul proves that he wasn't against circumcision. In Acts 16, look at what happens here in Acts 16. Then he came to Derbe and Lystra, and behold, a certain disciple was there named Timothy, the son of a certain Jewish woman who believed, but his father was Greek. He was well spoken of by the brethren who were at Lystra and Iconium. Paul wanted to have him go, with, go on with him, and he took him and circumcised him because of the Jews who were in that region, for they all knew that his father was Greek. Was Paul against circumcision? He was not against circumcision. What Paul was against, Paul was against was the, was the act of submitting to the dogma of the house of Shammai. This is what he stood against. So circumcision out of obedience to the written Torah, Paul was not against it. Paul, is, it, it's, a, it's a good thing. It's a, it's a sign of the covenant in the flesh. In fact, it goes back before that, before Israel, you know, the, the nation of Israel, it goes back to Abraham. It was the sign of the covenant with Abraham in his flesh. But what he was against was, submit, was you know, the, the, the circumcision out of submission to the house of Hillel and their dogma. Which is why, and we'll, 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 we, we may come back to Acts 10 this time or maybe next time, but now I want you to turn to Galatians chapter 1. Galatians chapter 1. Let's read, let's begin to study Galatians with this understanding of the house of Shema. Galatians chapter 1, let's just let's pick out a few pieces. Go to verse 6 and it says this, I marvel that you are turning away so soon from him who called you in the grace of Messiah to a different gospel, which is not another, but there are some who trouble you and want to pervert the gospel of Messiah. Let's ask ourselves a question. Who was creating the problem? Who was creating the problem? Who was presenting the different gospel? To find that information, we go to Galatians chapter 2, because Galatians 2 is going to tell us who was causing the problem? Who was bringing a different gospel? Galatians chapter 2 and verse 1. Then after 14 years I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas and also took Titus with me. And I went up by revelation and communicated to them that gospel which I preached among the Gentiles, but privately to those who were of reputation, lest by any means I might run or had run in vain. What is Paul referring to here? Paul is referring to the time in Acts chapter 15 when he came before the Jerusalem council. He says, 14 years ago I went to Jerusalem and I met with those of reputation. He's referencing Acts chapter 15, the meeting with the Jerusalem Council. So let's turn to Acts 15. We're going to come back to that, but let's go to Acts 15. Are you still with me this morning? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Acts chapter 15. And see if you can't pick out some of the key players that are here in Acts chapter 15. Verse 1. Certain men came down from Judea and taught the brethren... Unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. Who are we talking about? Shammai. Shammai. This is Shammai. All right, let's keep, uh, let's keep reading. Therefore, when Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and dispute with them, they determined that Paul and Barnabas and certain others of them should go up to Jerusalem to the apostles and elders about this question. So being sent on their way by the church, they passed through Phoenicia and Samaria, 
describing the conversions of the Gentiles and caused great joy to all the brethren. And when they had come to Jerusalem, they were received by the church and the apostles and the elders, and they reported all things that God had done with them. But some of the sect of the Pharisees who believed rose up, saying, It is necessary to circumcise them and to command them to keep the law of Moses. Now when the apostles and elders came together to consider this matter, and when there, was, when there had been much dispute, Peter rose up and said to them, Men and brethren, you know that a good while ago God chose among us that by the mouth, my mouth the Gentiles should hear the word of the gospel and believe. So God, who knows the hearts, acknowledged them by giving them the Holy Spirit, just as he did to us, and made no distinction between us and them, purifying their hearts by faith. Now therefore, why do you test God by putting a yoke on the neck of the disciples, which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear? But we believe that through the grace of our Lord, Yeshua Messiah, we shall be saved in the same manner as they. Then all the multitude kept silent and listened to Barnabas and Paul, declaring how many miracles and wonders God had worked <clears throat> through them among the Gentiles. <clears throat> Let's ask ourselves again. What is the what is the yoke? What is the what is scripture defined as what is too heavy, too difficult to bear? Not according to men, because men have their own idea of what is what is bondage, what is legalism, what is too heavy to bear. But according to scripture, what is too heavy to bear? The conditions of Shema. The difficulty. This is exactly what Messiah references in Matthew 23. You remember when he says, you know, when the scribes and the Pharisees are sitting upon the seat of Moses, therefore, do whatever they tell you to observe and do, that observe and do. But don't do what they do, for they heap heavy burdens on men's shoulders too difficult to bear. And then right after that, what does he accuse them of? You are shutting up the kingdom to men. Who is he addressing? He's addressing Shammai. He's addressing the edicts of Shammai, the 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 hoops that they were causing men to have to jump through. Is Peter, many will say Peter's talking about the Torah here, the written Torah given to Moses. We know that not to be the case. Why? Because the Torah is called liberty. Psalm 119, 44 and 45, James 1, 25, 1 John 5, 3, the Torah is called liberty. It's not a burden. Sin is the bondage, and breaking the Torah is bondage. We've got to help men to understand that. If you want to stay out of bondage, you want to stay out of sin, then walk in the Torah, because that's how you keep from sinning. So we see, we see James now, again in Acts, in, in Acts 15, what does he do? He brings up the, the prophecy of Amos chapter 9. Verse 11, where the Lord says he's going to rebuild the tabernacle of David and he's going to use Gentiles. Okay, then we see them lay out, lay out uh, uh, the, the three things that these Gentiles needed to do in order to have fellowship, in order to even come into the synagogue, the three things they needed to do. Okay. And then we go into verse 22. But then it, when it, well, uh, then it pleased the apostles and the elders and the whole church to send chosen men of their own company to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas, namely Judas, who was also named Barsabbas, and Silas, leading men among the brethren. They wrote this letter by them, the apostles and the elders and the brethren, to the brethren who are, in, with, who are of the Gentiles in Antioch, Syria, and Cilicia, since we have heard that some who went out from us have troubled you with words, unsettling your souls, saying you must be circumcised, and keep the law to whom we gave no such commandment. What is happening there? Many will teach us. Say we specifically told them they don't need to keep the Torah. We've got to ask ourselves a question. What is Acts 15 all about? Salvation. What did the what did Shammai say? They have to be they have to be circumcised according to the custom of Moses in order to be saved. The whole thing in Acts 15 is about salvation. It's about coming to salvation. You see this? That's why verse 21 says, For Moses has had throughout many generations those who preach him in every city 
being read in the synagogue every Sabbath. What is he saying? He's saying we have synagogues all over the cities. They're teaching Moses every single Sabbath. Deal with these. Deal with these major sins right here that are right out of the Torah. These are right out of the Torah. To deal with sin, deal with these sins, and then come every single Sabbath and learn how to walk in the righteous instructions. That's verse 21. So they deliver the letter. We see in Acts 16, we see Paul circumcised Timothy. Now listen to this, though. In Acts 16, he circumcised Timothy. So let's stop for a second. If the Gentiles had only three requirements, which is what is, which is, what is taught from verse 20, uh, when it says to abstain from things polluted by idols, from sexual immorality, from things strangled, and from blood. Why do I say three? Because strangled and blood are the same thing. They're the same thing. So if they only had the three requirements, okay, and that was to that was to uh, abstain from things strangled by blood, from uh, or, um, excuse me, things polluted by idols, from sexual immorality, things strangled by blood, right? Because of Leviticus 17 says we're not to consume the life blood. So if an animal is strangled, what does it have? It still has its life blood in it. That's why I say these three things. When many times it's taught as four, it's the same thing. If it's strangled, it still has its life blooded. And that life blood was to be drained out. Okay? So if Paul is delivering a letter informing the Gentiles that they need to only worry about these three things, don't worry about stealing or murder, just worry about these three things, all right? Why would Paul circumcise Timothy as he is delivering them a letter telling them that there's no need to circumcise. It doesn't make any sense, does it? It doesn't. Paul's delivering them a letter telling them, you only have to keep these three things, you don't need to keep anything else. But then he circumcises Timothy on his way to deliver them a letter that said they don't need to be circumcised. It makes no sense whatsoever. Paul is not against circumcision. And you can see that if you really read, study circumcision. He's not against circumcision. He's against submitting to the, to, the, to the dogma of Shammai. Now, so we understand, who is the group in Acts 15.1 that's coming against these Gentiles? Shammai. Telling them they have to be circumcised in order to be saved. So now we go to Galatians chapter 2 and watch how the pieces start to fit together. Galatians chapter 2. And verse 3, look at what it says. Yet, he's just explained the meeting that he had at the Jerusalem Council. And then he says this. Yet not even Titus, who was with me, being a Greek, was compelled to be circumcised. Now, many teach that to say, see, he was standing against circumcision. <clears throat> we don't need to succumb to those, those commandments. He was standing against circumcision. What was he standing against? Standing against Shammai. He was not even compelled to be circumcised. Look at verse 4. And this occurred because a false brethren secretly brought in who had come to by stealth to spy out our liberty, which we have in Messiah Yeshua, that they might bring us into bondage. What is bondage? Bondage again is what Shammai, the edicts that he was putting, that they were putting on everybody. Are you seeing this? Okay, we know that Scripture teaches us that the Torah is not Bondage. What was the bondage? What was told in Matthew 23? What was described in Matthew 15? The regulations of the house of Shammai. Now let's read this again all the way down to verse 7 and see if you can't see Shammai. Yet not even Titus, who was with me, being a Greek, was compelled to be circumcised. And this occurred because a false brother and secretly brought in, who came, by, who came in by stealth to spy out our liberty, which we have in Yeshua Messiah, that they might bring us into bondage, to whom we did not yield submission even for an hour, that the truth of the gospel might continue with you. How does the scripture define truth? Psalm 119, 142. Your righteousness is an everlasting righteousness, and your Torah is truth. There's no other definition for truth but Torah. It's all throughout the scriptures. In whom we did not yield submission even for an hour, that the truth of the gospel might continue with you. But from those who seem to be something, whatever they were, it makes no difference to me. God shows personal favoritism to no man. 
For those who seem to be something added nothing to me. We're talking about favoritism again here, right? But on the contrary, when they saw that the gospel of the uncircumcised, the Gentiles, had been committed to me as the gospel for the circumcised was committed to Peter. Okay, I'm going to stop right there. because We've we got to fly through the rest of this. You can see Shammai popping its ugly head up. Then right away in the next passage, what are we looking at? We're looking at the influence of Shammai. Look at verse 11. Now when Peter had come to Antioch, I was stood into his face because he was to be blamed. For before certain men came from James, he would eat with the Gentiles. But when they came, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing those who were of the circumcision. And the rest of the Jews also played the hypocrite with him, so that even Barnabas was carried away with their hypocrisy. Again, where, what are we looking at? We're looking at Shammai. This is the problem. Shammai is the problem. Those of the house of Shammai appear, Peter withdraws, prompting Paul to confront him. Now as you read the next verse, look at what it says. But when I saw that they were, not, they were not straightforward about the truth of the gospel, I said to Peter before them all, If you being a Jew, living in the manner of Gentiles, and not as the Jews, why do you compel Gentiles to live as Jews? Okay? I'm going to read you the commentary from my Bible. I love this Bible. This is, this is my favorite Bible, but let me read you the commentary so you can see the mainstream mindset towards this passage of Scripture. This is what my Bible says here in my commentary. Paul charges Peter, who no longer observes Jewish food regulations, according to verse 12. I love this Bible. Let's go back and read verse 12 and let's see if we come to that same conclusion. For before certain men came from James, he would eat with the Gentiles. But when they came, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing those who were of the circumcision. Did I miss any place where it said ham sandwiches in there? Did I miss, did I miss the shrimp cocktail? That just shows, but it just shows the bias. That all of a sudden we're to take that and we're to assume that, that Paul was now eating unclean foods because he was eating with the Gentiles. I promised you Paul had more influence over the Gentiles, and Peter had more influence over the Gentiles than they had over him. They were coming into this faith. But I, I say that just to, just to say it's, it's amazing how we can just, all of a sudden we read that and we just assume that Peter's eating ham sandwiches. There's nothing even written about what was on the menu. Nothing. You've got to get this part. This part is so important. Besides, Acts 10 contradicts that because that's 10 years after Messiah has already ascended. And what does Peter say? He says, Lord, no unclean thing has ever come into my mouth. 10 years after Messiah, he's saying, I've never eaten an unclean thing. Well, Peter, don't you realize how free you are now in Messiah? That you don't have to follow those rules and regulations? Peter didn't get the memo. Even though he walked with Messiah, he didn't get the memo. Okay, excuse my sarcasm. But now let's look at verse 15 and 16, because this is what I, you've got to see this this morning. This is so important. We who are Jews by nature and not sinners of the Gentiles, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Yeshua Messiah, even we have believed in Yeshua Messiah, that we might be justified by faith in Messiah and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law, no flesh shall be justified. Now let's stop for a second. This word justified, let me pull this up. This is the word dikaio. Strong's number 1344. It means to render righteous. To declare, to pronounce one to be just, or to pronounce one to be righteous. So what is Paul saying here? He's saying, knowing this, that for by the works of the law, no flesh shall be declared righteous. We're all in agreement. That's what he's saying. Okay? Let's look at Romans chapter 2, and let's, we've got to get an understanding here. Go to Romans chapter 2. And verse 13, look at what Paul says. For not the hearers of the Torah are just. This word again, the kayo. 
in the sight of God, but the doers of the Torah will be justified. This again is the word dikayil. Pull it up again. To render righteous, to declare, to pronounce one to be just or righteous. What is happening here? Is Paul talking out of both sides of his mouth? Over here he says, by the works of the law, no flesh shall be declared righteous. Over here in Romans 2, he's saying, for not the hearers of the law are declared righteous in the sight of God, but the doers of the Torah will be declared righteous. What is happening here? Obviously, we are not understanding the term works of the law. This is what's important. This is what we're going to look at. Let's ask ourselves a, a, a question. In, Levitic, or in uh, Galatians 2, 11 through 13, was Peter obeying the law of Moses? In 11 through 13, this specific act that he was doing, was he obeying the law of Moses? No, because the law of Moses says that he's okay to, to interact with Gentiles. If they're willing to submit to the, to the covenant instructions, treat them as a native born, the word of the Lord says. There's one law. Uh, Numbers 15, 15 through 16. One law for the native born and for the stranger dwelling among you. So we ask ourselves a question in verse 11 through 13. Was Peter obeying Torah or was he obeying the oral law? Oral laws and traditions. Could that be what Paul is talking about when he says works of the law? Because Peter wasn't obeying Torah. He was, he, was, he was actually obeying the pharisaical decrees, the house of Shammai decrees. Could that be what he was talking about when he references works of the law? He was obeying the oral Torah traditions. The reference to the works of the law would have to be a reference towards what Paul was confronting Peter about. Here's the evidence. This is confirmed in the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls. Don't miss this. The Dead Sea Scrolls. Scroll 4QMMT. This is what that means. 4QMMT. 4 is cave number 4. Q is Qumran. The MMT stands for Mixat Maaseh HaTorah, pertinent precepts of the law. This is this is scroll 4Q MMT. Investigate this, study it. You can pull it up because this was discovered back in 1947, but it wasn't translated into English until 1994 and made made uh, available to the public. In 1994, this is this holds a tremendous key here. It was these. The, if you know anything about the about the, the the scrolls, the Dead Sea Scrolls, they've determined that they they are at least 100 BCE to 70 of the Common Era. So this covers that first century mindset. Got the timeline? It covers the first century mindset. Let's take a look at what it says here. The next scroll. In the November December 1994 issue of Biblical Archaeological Review, scholar Martin Abegg commented on the importance of this document to understanding Paul's letter to the Galatians. In all of antiquity, only the manifesto and Paul's letters to the Galatians and Romans discuss the connection between works and righteousness. For that reason alone, this writing is of immense interest and importance, but the manifesto has additional significance. While the sectarian documents found in the caves at Qumran fairly bristle with legal discussions on a variety of issues, only this work, commonly known as 4QMMT, an acronym from the Hebrew word meaning some of the works of the law, directly challenges the position of another religious group. The manifesto presents a well-reasoned argument couched in a homily completed with applications, illustrations, and exhortations following a thesis statement that identifies the central problem. The impure are being allowed to mix with the pure, 
the profane with the holy. The author lists some two dozen examples to prove his point. The addressee and secondarily the reader is then encouraged to follow the author, separate from those who practice such things. Stop for a second, page 358 of the Dead Sea Scrolls, a new translation. So what is this saying? This is saying that they, that they are finding there were two dozen examples, instructions, given for the purpose. What was the purpose? To keep from mixing the impure with the, with the pure. Okay? And to separate from those who practice such things. Okay? No doubt this isn't the, no doubt this was the, the mindset. If you will do these 24 things, it will keep you from mingling the pure with the unpure, and it will separate you from those type of people who do those impure things. So let's read actually what the translation from the scroll for QMMT says. Now we have written to you some of the works of the law. Those which we determined would be beneficial for you and your people because we have seen that you possess insight and knowledge of the law, understand all these things, and beseech him to set your counsel straight and so keep you away from evil thoughts and the counsel of Belial. Then you shall rejoice at the end time when you find the essence of our words to be true and it will be reckoned to you as righteousness and that you have done what is right and good before him to your own benefit and to that of Israel. Page 364, the Dead Sea Scrolls. Mainstream doctrine has interpreted the works of the law as referring to the law of Moses. But the evidence found in 4QMMT equates the works of the law to 24 instructions to keep from mixing the holy with the profane and to separate themselves from those who practice such things. Listen to that in the context of what we have just studied about Shammai. <laughs> Now let's quickly look at this phrase that's used by Paul. Romans chapter 3, verse 27. Where is boasting then? Is it excluded by what law? Of works? No, but by the law of faith. Therefore we conclude that a man is justified by deeds apart from, justified by faith, apart, go back, justified by faith, Apart from the deeds, apart from the works of the law. Okay? Now we keep going because the deeds and works is the same word in the Greek. Or is he the God of the Jews only? Is he not also the God of the Gentiles? Can you see the discussion? Yes, of the Gentiles also, since there is one God who will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through faith. Do we then make void the Torah through faith? Certainly not. On the contrary, we establish the Torah. There's the first place we're going to see the works of the law. Discussing Gentiles, right? Discussing the Jew and the Gentile. Let's go to the next one. Let's go to Romans chapter 9. Verse 30. Now, what shall we say then? That Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness have attained to righteousness, even the righteousness of faith? But Israel, pursuing the Torah of righteousness, have, has not attained to the Torah of righteousness. Why? Because they did not seek it by faith, but as it were, by the works of the law. For they stumbled at the stumbling stone. As it is written, Behold, I lay a stop in Zion a stumbling stone and the rock of offense, and whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. Let's go on to the next one. Go to 10. Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they may be saved. 
For I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. For by being ignorant of God's righteousness, what is God's righteousness? His Torah, Isaiah 51, verse 7. Listen to me, you who know righteousness and whose heart is my Torah. Okay? Who know, what, what, for being ignorant of God's righteousness and seeking to establish their own righteousness. What have we just talked about? We just talked about the works of the law. Their own righteousness have not submitted to the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. For Moses writes about the righteousness which is of the Torah. The man who does those things shall live by them. What does it mean that Christ is the end of the law for righteousness? That word end is the word telos in the Greek and it means the goal. He's the goal. He's the standard. He's the set. He's the one. What does John tell us? That if we abide in him, we ought to walk as he walked. Amen? Amen? Come on. So he is the goal for righteousness. The works of the law are not the goal for righteousness. They're not going to lead us to the goal. What will lead us to the goal? The righteousness that is from God will lead us to the goal. He is the goal. Okay? See, I just wanted us to look at where this phrase is used. Galatians 3, 1 and 2. Hang with me. We're almost there. O foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you that you should not obey the truth? For before whose eyes Yeshua Messiah was clearly portrayed among you as crucified. This only I want to learn from you. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Here's, a, here's, here's where men have a trouble with this because they think faith is just a cognitive thing. Faith is not a cognitive thing. Faith is evidenced by your works. Without, right? Works, your faith is dead, James tells us. And here's the problem. Men, men will read this. Let me read one more. Go to Galatians 3, 5 and 6. Therefore, he who supplies the Spirit to you and works miracles among you does, he do it by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith. Just as Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. This is totally misinterpreted in mainstream doctrine because they'll say that Abraham just believed and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Did Abraham just believe? Was it a cognitive response that I'm just going to believe? No, it was evidenced by his obedience. It was evidenced by his life that he believed. Genesis 26 and verse 5. What it says... Because Abraham obeyed my voice, kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes, and my Torah. Then he says this in Galatians 3. This is the last area that he uses this. Galatians 3, verse 10. Almost there. Galatians 3, verse 10. You're locking up. It's right underneath Genesis 26. It's not? Oh, did I not put it in there? Oh my goodness, here it is. <laughs> for as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse. For it is written, Curse is everyone who does not continue in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. Look at Paul's, look, just look at what Paul says there. Those things that are not written. Emphasis on written when you're dealing with the house of Shammai. The emphasis is on the written. For as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse. For it is written, curse is everyone who does not continue in all things which are written in the book of the Torah to do them. This is so important. Now bear with me. Just give me five more minutes. Give me five more minutes because we're going to set this. Okay? Give me five more minutes. What's that? Who give me five more minutes? 5, 10, 15, 20. It's an old pastor's joke. I use it. It works every time. <laughs> now that we know who is troubling the Galatians, we know that it is Shammai who is troubling the Galatians with this, with this understanding, with their teaching, that, that circumcision precedes everything. 
and takes prominence over everything. Now we look at Galatians chapter 6 and we see what Paul says. He's going to reveal who is giving them trouble in Galatia. See what, with what large letters I have written to you with my own hand, as many as desire to make a good showing in the flesh, these would compel you to be circumcised, only that they may not suffer persecution for the cross of Christ. For not even those who are circumcised keep the Torah, but they desire to have you circumcised, that they may boast in your flesh. He's revealing who these people are. They are Shemai. For in Messiah Yeshua, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avails anything but a new creation. Let's quickly get some clarity on what Paul is saying there. Is circumcision the priority in the Torah? Is it the priority? No. Is it a commandment? Yep. Is it the priority of Torah? No. Who was circumcision the priority with? Shemai. The Father is most concerned with circumcision of our hearts first. This is what we have to understand about the Torah. He is concerned with the circumcision of our heart first. Then the circumcision in our flesh as an act of obedience, a sign of the covenant in our flesh. Look at what he says here in Deuteronomy chapter 10. And now Israel, what does the Lord your God require of you but to fear the Lord your God? to walk in all his ways and to love him, to serve the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and to keep the commandments of the Lord and his statutes which I command you today for your good. Indeed, heaven and the highest heavens belong to the Lord your God, also the earth with all that is in it. The Lord delighted only in your fathers to love them and he chose their descendants after them you above all peoples, as it is this day. Therefore, circumcise the foreskin of your heart and be stiff-necked no longer. This is the Father's heart's desire, is that we would be a people who are circumcised in heart. We are obeying the Father because we have, we have His Word, we have His instructions written on our heart. It's not about sitting here doing a checklist. Okay, I did that, I did that, I did that. Are you happy? I did that, I did that, I did that. No, but we understand the Father's righteous instructions. We know them. We've written them on our heart. So when we worship the Father, we can say, Lord, I know what is important to you. I know what is pleasing to you, and I want to please you. I want to do those things because my heart has been circumcised. Your, your, what did, what did, what did the, the, the psalmist say? Your word I have written on my heart, that I might not sin against you. This is the Father's plan. First, it was circumcision of our hearts. Deuteronomy 30, verse 6 through 8. This is the promise when the Lord says he's going to come and regather them. The Lord says this, and the Lord your God will circumcise your heart and the heart of your descendants to love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul that you may live. Also, the Lord your God will put all these curses on your enemies and on those who hate you, who persecuted you. And you will again obey the voice of the Lord and do all his commandments, which I command you today. Let me tell you something. Right here in this verse, I'm getting ready to, to, to preach a message on honor and shame. I've been studying this out, and I cannot study this without, without weeping like a baby. We're gonna, I don't know if we're going to hit it this week. Let me see where the Lord leads this week or the following week. But I promise you, as we study honor and shame, you will, want, you will want nothing other than to obey the Lord's Torah. You will, it, will, it will bless you to obey His commandments. When we get an understanding of Middle Eastern culture and how they see honor and shame, I'm gonna, it's, it's, it's what's called a zero-sum base. And it's very important if we're going to understand Messiah, if we're going to understand the Father Himself. Because this is the understanding. And we're coming from an area where we really don't understand honor and shame. I promise you, you will read the word differently when you understand honor and shame. It's revolutionized my life. You're gonna, I can't even tell my wife without crying. 
because it's just, it's absolutely the most beautiful picture and it makes you want to be obedient to the Father. And because in your obedience, you are restoring his honor. It's glorious. So get ready. I'm going to teach that in the next week or two and, and get ready to be just transformed. Why physical? Why was physical circumcision? What was physical cir circumcision important? Yes, a couple more scripture verses. A sign of the flesh, of the, in the covenant of the flesh. Remember in Joshua 5, I'm not going to read it, we'll run out of time. Joshua 5, verses 2 through 5, the Lord, they were walking with Messiah. They were, or they were walking with, with, uh, with uh, the Lord. They were learning the Torah. They're grown men, and then the Lord says, their fathers were circumcised, but these men have never been circumcised. Circumcise them before you bring them into the promised land, right? So was circumcision the priority in the Torah? No, Father wanted them to be circumcised in their hearts, then circumcised in their flesh. So it wasn't right away when, when, when he took, take these young men and circumcise them. No, he was teaching them Torah. Now I want you to take these men because they have not yet been circumcised. Study that out. This is important to get the heart of the Father and to understand the motivations of Shammai. All right, so... So why was the covenant why was the covenant sign of circumcision important to, to or was it important? Yes, but but it wasn't priority number one as it was in Shammai. Circumcision of the heart, or which was representing our obedience, is what was important to the Lord, which is why Paul says in 1 Corinthians 7, verse 18 and 19, look at what he says. Was anyone called while well circumcised? Let him not become uncircumcised. Was anyone called while well uncircumcised? Let him not be circumcised. Okay, still dealing with Shemai. Circumcision is nothing. Uncircumcision is nothing. But keeping the commandments of God is what matters. Why? Because a circumcised heart is going to keep the commandments of God. And, 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 and understand, you're dealing with Shemai here. Go again to Romans. This is the last chapter, our last verse. Romans chapter 2, verse 25. For circumcision is indeed profitable if you keep the Torah. But if you are a breaker of the Torah, your circumcision has become uncircumcision. What is he saying here? It doesn't matter if you're circumcised in your flesh. If you're breaking the law, if your circumcision has become uncircumcision. It doesn't matter. You're demonstrating that your heart has not been circumcised. Therefore, if an uncircumcised man keeps the righteous requirements of the Torah... Will not his uncircumcision be counted as circumcision? And will not the physically uncircumcised, if he fulfills the Torah, judge you who even with your written code and circumcision are a transgressor of the Torah? For he is not a Jew who is one outwardly, nor is circumcision that which is outward in the flesh, but he is a Jew who is one inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart in the spirit, not in the letter, whose praise is not from men, but from God. You get a clearer picture of this. Awesome. Because this is what we need to get, we need to take out of this. This phrase, works of the law, is not, we're not talking about the written Torah. We are called to practice righteousness. We're called to practice Torah. Practice Torah. First John chapter 2 and 1 John chapter 3. We're called to practice Torah. Amen? Amen. All right, will you stand to your feet? Do you feel like a marathon today? One at a time, we're going to we're going to beat back this lie that says that the works of the law are the Torah. Listen. Can you be made, it's, it's, it's like, here's the deal. They say, well, you're trying, to do the, you're trying to do the Torah, so you're trying to be saved in, by, by yourself. No, 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 no. If I'm doing the Torah, that's his righteousness, not my righteousness. When I come up with all these other rules and regulations like Shammai came up with, then what am I doing? I'm trying to come up with my own righteousness. But if I'm following Torah, these aren't mine. I didn't come up with this stuff. These are his instructions. So what am I following? I'm following his righteousness if I follow the Torah. Men need to understand this. Yeah. And you're not going to want to do that if the Spirit of God has not come into your life, Ezekiel 36, verse 27, and caused you to want to keep his statutes and his judgments and his ways and do them. That's why. Hallelujah. Let's pray and then we're going to eat. Amen?
Father, I thank you, Lord. Lord, it is our heart to love you. And we're learning every day, Lord God, how to love you with a deeper love, with a, with a God, a, a love that you deserve to be loved, Lord God, by your people. You deserve to be loved by your people, Lord God. And the Messiah says, if you love me, keep my commandments. That's our heart, Lord God, is to love you deeper, more fulfilling, the way you have said you want to be loved. Not the way I've decided I want to love you, but the way you have said, this is how I want to be loved. God, we want to love you that way. We bless your name. You are so good. And you're revealing yourself in such a powerful way, and we thank you, Lord. Now, Lord, as we sit down and we eat this meal together, Lord God, Lord, we're thankful for your provision. We bless you for the provision. It has come from your hands. May our words be pleasing to you. May our motivations be pleasing to you. I thank you, Lord, for this body. I thank you for this gathering of believers here who desire you and you alone and I bless them I bless them Lord God in you May his name be written upon you forever in Hashem Yeshua, we pray. And may all of us be found among his covenant people when he returns. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. Amen.